Okay, I'm going to try to finish Job. I'm going to have to hurry. So uh, they're off. All right, now in chapter 38, Job gets an audience with God, but uh, it's God who confronts Job rather than the other way around. And I want to pick up where we left off last week. And you have these rhetorical questions in 38, 12 to 15 that, it, that assert that God and not man, he knows and manages creation. He alone brings the dawn that causes evildoers, those who love darkness. In fact, darkness is their light. But he alone brings the dawn that causes the evildoers to retreat and reveals the features and the colors of the earth. And then in 16 and 17, God exposes Job's ignorance of the mysteries of the oceans and the realm of the dead. That's beyond what any human being knows. And then 18 to 21, he exposes Job's ignorance of the size of the earth and where night and day reside when they're not being experienced. See, and that, of course, relates to what in Job's day were celestial and astronomical mysteries. And then in 38, 22 to 30, he highlights Job's ignorance of meteorolo meteorological phenomena. Job's clueless about the bringing of rain and snow and hail and storms and lightning and wind and dew and frost and ice. He doesn't have any clue about any of that. Now, we've learned a great deal about those things through our investigation and exploration of God's creation. But don't be fooled. There's still plenty we don't know. You see, our ignorance seems to be bottomless. The more we open doors, the more we see there are more doors to open. But he's saying here to Job in his day about these things that he's absolutely clueless about. And then in 38, 31, or 38, 31 to... 38, he continues with questions that reveal Job's place in the universe, that he's a creature and not God. The heavens with their constellations, they were created by God and they operate as determined by God and Job can do nothing regarding those things. God alone controls and he directs the storms and the rains. He also is the one who imbued the ibis and the rooster. Now that translation is uncertain and your translation may say something different. But it's probably saying that God is the one who imbued the ibis and the rooster with whatever behavior it was that caused those creatures to be associated in the ancient world with wisdom. And they were associated with wisdom. So he's saying that he's the one who imbued those creatures with those behaviors that are associated then with wisdom. And then 39 to 41, only God can provide food for the lion and the raven and their young. See, he's the one who in cursing creation after the fall, he established a sustainable ecosystem. You know, he's the one who did that in a world that now includes predation. God did that. That's way above mankind's pay grade. We can't even run an aquarium. And he established this sustainable ecosystem in this world of predation. He says in 39, 1 to 4, that, that he and not Job knows the rhythms and the details of the lives of inaccessible mountain goats. He says, what do you got for me on that, Job? In verses 5 to 8, only he knows how the wild donkey, the onager, came to dwell where it does. Job doesn't know that. He says in 39, 9 to 12, he continues pounding home that, home that Job is not in charge of or in control of the created order. Job can't control such a powerful beast as the wild ox and have that thing serve him. Only God can do that. See, only God can do that. He says in verses 13 to 18 that unlike the behaviors of the ibis and the rooster, assuming that's the correct rendering, unlike the behaviors of those creatures that are considered wise, 
God has imbued the ostrich with behavior regarding her eggs and her young that's regarded as foolish. But on the other hand, he has, he has endowed the ostrich with great speed. And the point is that God gives certain traits to the various animals as he determines. No human being does that. No human being determines how these creatures live, act, behave, their qualities, their characteristics. That's way beyond what any human being can do. And here is Job coming to God and complaining about God. And God comes down and confronts Job and says, let's have a little test. Let's see who really is God and who's the creature. And so that's what he's doing, running through there. In 39, 19 to 25, he says that Job didn't give the war horse its strength, its appearance, its abilities. Only God did that. He says in verses 26 to 30 that it's not, it's not by Job's understanding and design that the eagle has the characteristics and behaviors that it has. That's because of God. Only God did that. That's his work. And then he says in chapter 40, verses 1 and 2, he concludes his first speech to Job with this rhetorical question. He says, shall a fault finder? That's Job. Shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? Now, Job knows better than to answer that question. See, Job had been talking about, I want this audience, 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 all this stuff. God has appeared to Job, and he's given him some questions to think about. And then God says this to Job, shall a fault finder contend with the Almighty? And Job says, no, I think I'm going to let that challenge pass. I don't think I'm going to hop on that. And in verses 3 to 5, Job's confrontation with God, it's not turning out the way Job envisioned. Remember, Job, during the dialogues, Job is thinking about, you know, he's just imagining, uh, fantasizing about, you know, I'd call him down here and I'd be in court and I'd slap him around and, you know, I'd get justice. That's what would happen. Well, this isn't turning out quite that way. Job is getting an education, in fact. His confrontation isn't turning out as he imagined. See, he's been put in his place, and he can only confess what? That he's small before God. That's all he can say, is that he's small before God, and he's unable to say anything in his defense. That's where Job is. He won't add to his earlier statements, to which he presumably now reg regrets having made. Because God has appeared to him and has said these things that Job's now sitting silent. He's not going to respond. He's not going to add to what he already said. As I say, I think he regrets having said that. And then in chapter 40, verses 6 to 14, God unleashes another torrent of questions toward Job, designed further to drive home Job's place in the universe. You see, and, and though Job was rendered silent by that first round of questions from God, he thought better of accusing God of wrong when God gives him all these questions and then says, who will contend with the Almighty? You're up, Job. And Job said, mm, I think I'll sit here. I'm small. Okay? So, but now he has this second round of questions Job was rendered silent by that. He thought better of accusing God by that first round of questions. He sits silent, thinks better of accusing God. But he didn't express regret or repentance for the things that he'd said previously. And the fact that God continues to speak to him from the storm, from the whirlwind. You see, that symbolizes God's continuing displeasure. That he continues speaking this way to Job. And God tells Job to brace for more questions. Now the first two of which in, in verse 8, the first two questions there in verse 8 are very significant because they reveal or confirm the import of some of Job's words in his earlier speeches. See, God accuses Job there in those questions in verse 8 of illegitimately 
undermining his justice by asking if Job will discredit, see, his, God's justice. Will Job put God in the wrong? So now we see, okay, so that's right. That confirms what we see Job was doing. Job was blaming God and accusing God of injustice and wrong. And he asked if Job will sacrifice his, God's reputation, by charging him with wrong to save his own reputation as a righteous man. Now that's exactly what Job was doing. That's exactly what he was doing. Job is saying, I'm righteous and I'm getting pounded, therefore he's unjust. Because you shouldn't be thinking that I'm not righteous because I am righteous. So he throws God under the bus. Rather than think or consider, he's, he, Job is righteous, we know that. But this is what God asked him here. He says, will you sacrifice his reputation, God's, in charging him with wrong to save his own reputation as a righteous man? And rather than tell Job his righteous reason for allowing him to suffer, he never tells Job that. Rather than tell Job his righteous reason for allowing him to suffer, God emphasizes that he, and not Job, is powerful, majestic, splendid, and glorious. And he indicates that by challenging Job to adorn himself with those traits. To show them forth. Go ahead, show me. You show me your majesty. Your splendor. Show them forth. So he's saying in that that he is the one who is splendid and, and glorious and majestic. And he then challenges Job to bring judgment on the arrogant and the wicked. If Job can't do those things, which of course Job cannot, then he has no business crossing swords with God. He said, wait, wait. You can't do these things. Show me your glory. Show me your splendor. You go ahead and you judge the, the wicked person. You do these things. You judge the arrogant. You judge the wicked. Can you do those things? Oh, no, I can't. Well, then what are you talking about? How are you coming to me and raising an accusation against me when you can't do those things? And so he wants Job to understand that. But see, he doesn't tell Job. And that, that'll be a point I hope I have time to develop. He doesn't let Job know. Now, we as readers know the righteous reason God has for allowing Job to suffer. But see, because God has revealed it to us. Job is from down here living through it. He's not privy to that revelation and therefore doesn't understand it. There's an important point in that. Really, it's, I think, the dominant point of the book. He says in 40, 15 to 24, he directs Job's attention to behemoth, a super beast that God had created as he created Job. And the description that he gives is of a huge river-dwelling herbivore that's too powerful to be captured or controlled by mankind. Now, most understand behemoth. Most understand this creature to be a hippopotamus. But the reference to its tail being in some way like a cedar tree, that seems to me to fit better with some kind of dinosaur. A hippopotamus has got a little tail. So that just seems to me to be off. Now, of course, one who accepts the story of Earth history that is preached by the scientific establishment will reject that possibility. Indeed, Tremper Longman calls it preposterous. You see, because under the scientific establishment story of Earth history, dinosaurs lived and were extinct long before man came on the scene, so they'd have no knowledge or anything about dinosaurs. Okay? Now, I'm convinced that the scientific establishment story, which is not a fact, despite how it's presented, it is an inference, deductions, it is a story that is constructed of history 
I am convinced that that story of history that they tell contradicts the story that God has revealed. Okay, so I am free to say, I think this is some kind of extinct creature, be it dinosaur or whatever. Okay, but I leave that to you there. In 41, in chapter 41, you have the Lord's second speech. It ends with reference to another of his amazing creatures, and this is Leviathan. So he refers to Leviathan, and he, and he has questions there that are designed to establish that God alone controls such a tremendous beast. So you have in 41 this discussion, 1 to 34, of, of Leviathan. Now, most understand Leviathan to be a crocodile. That's how most people take Leviathan, but the identified features, even allowing for metaphorical language and some degree of hyperbole, they don't seem to me to fit very squarely with the crocodile. So again, I think it may refer to some extinct creature that was either was either known to Job or was known or or was remembered in Job's day. Okay, now you can, if crocodiles, you think that's a crocodile, okay, I'm not sold. All right, but in any event, that's not the point. The point is there's this tremendous uh, creature that God is responsible for, and only God is able to control such a creature. Now in 42, 1 to 6, we now see Job repents. Job repents here. See, between the agony of his prolonged suffering, which has been tremendous, between that agony and between his mistaken commitment of retribution, his mistaken commitment to retribution theology, Job's vision of God, it became clouded so that he concluded that God was doing wrong, that God was punishing him unjustly, to paraphrase the psalmist in Psalm 73 too, Job's feet had begun to stumble and his steps had begun to slip. This mighty theophany, this appearance of God and this experience of God's presence, that renewed and reaffirmed Job's conviction that God's about his absolute power and his sovereignty. And Job confesses that God can do all things. See, within which he now includes the seemingly impossible task from Job's theological perspective of allowing the righteous to suffer as Job has suffered. He now says, you can do all things. Even this seemingly impossible thing of allowing the righteous to suffer. So he's now, see, this this confrontation with God has had an effect on him. And Job refers back to God's accusing question in chapter 38, verse 2. Who is this who, who is this that hides counsel, obscures or hides counsel without knowledge? And Job confesses that he did indeed obscure counsel. That is, that he made sound advice or sound instruction difficult to perceive by speaking in ignorance about things that were way above his pay grade. His trust in his own wisdom. This is important. His trust in his own wisdom led him to conclude that God was in the wrong in his case. You see, rather than to assume something was going on that he simply didn't understand. See, rather than take that option, I don't know. (laughs) No, he was so confident of his own wisdom that he would go and say, God's in the wrong. God is never in the wrong. (laughs) He's never in the wrong. But Job was led to say that, you see. He was led to, uh, because of his confidence in his own understanding. He refers back to God's command to listen up and to prepare to answer God's questions which questions impressed upon Job God's displeasure with Job's accusation that God was unjust. Whereas Job had previously been operating only under hearsay about God. 
That's how he picked up his absolutist retribution theology. It was from his community and culture. He picked it up by hearsay. This personal and personal encounter, it led Job to realize that something else is going on. Something else is going on. That encounter forced on Job. This theophany, this encounter that he has with God, it forced on him the possibility that the dichotomy under which he and his friends were operating, either Job was a sinner or God was unjust. That's it. This forced on Job the realization that this dichotomy was a false one. You see, it was a false one, even if he couldn't see the justification for his suffering. Even if he can't make sense and doesn't have an answer to why. And he doesn't because God doesn't give it to him. But he realizes from this experience with God that this dichotomy under which they've been, that's got to be false. Because I'm not a sinner and God is not unjust. So... There's something wrong. I don't know what it is, but I'm willing to recognize the problem lies in the inability of my wisdom to grasp what's going on. Oh, is that important? You see, that's where the problem lies. Now, that's why Job says he despises himself or despises the things he said. And he repents in dust and ashes, which refer to symbols of mourning. That's in the ashes, sprinkling dust on your head. So he has this symbol of mourning. He'd been pulled by his suffering and his mistaken theology to accuse Almighty God. But he never cursed God. You see, he never cursed God in the sense of rejecting him. He struggled in this vortex of his suffering to make sense of, of what God was doing. And he was handicapped in that by his overly simplistic theology. But in that, he never cursed God. The fact Job repented doesn't mean that his friends had been right all along. You remember his friends kept saying, if you will just repent, you will be restored. The answer lies in your repentance. Well, the fact that Job here repents doesn't mean that they were right all along, that the solution to his troubles was repentance. See, what he repented of here was not you know, some hidden sin that was the cause of his suffering as alleged by his friends. There was no such sin. We know that. Job is the most righteous of people. He is a paragon of righteousness, the one chosen by God to be mankind's standard bearer in the contest with Satan. So that wasn't the case. Rather, he repented of the things he'd said against God during the course of his prolonged suffering. Longman says, thus Job's speeches are not an example of the proper attitude toward God in the midst of suffering. Job has cracks. He winds up falsely accusing God. He says, granted, some elements are highly commendable. For instance, he never gives up on God or curses God. He does not capitulate to the weak arguments of his friends and repent of sins he never committed. You know that pressure would have been great. Nevertheless, God is not fully affirming Job's approach to him by a long stretch. And then he says, Longman says of, of Job's journey, he says at the end of the prologue, you know, so the first two chapters, that narrative prologue, at the end of the prologue, Job had shown himself obedient in spite of his suffering. As I say, that's where we usually stop. And then we go over to the epilogue. And we really miss the theology of the book. <laughs> you see, but he says here, at the end of the prologue, Job has shown himself obedient in spite of his suffering. But as time went on and the reader moved into the poetic dialogue, starting in chapter 3, Job certainly questioned whether obedience was worth it. Nonetheless, Job never turned disobedient in spite of his suffering. He questioned, 
He doubted. He demanded an audience with God, but he never abandoned God. Still, until the divine speeches begin, one wonders how long Job will hold on to his desire for a relationship with God. The ultimate answer to these questions comes in Job's final response when he repents and stands silent before God in whose presence he finds himself, even without an answer to his burning question about his suffering. Though the term fear is not used in Job's speech, fearing God is precisely what strikes him silent and submissive before God. He preserves his integrity until the bitter end, and this is important, before he has his prosperity restored. Job is not told by God that he will restore Job. Nonetheless, Job fears God. In this, Job demonstrates to all, the accuser seems long gone, that he will worship God in spite of of an absence of prosperity. Remember I said Job's motive fades after two, but it remains in the background, informing all that's going on? It does. And Job remains true to that test. He never becomes a spiritual prostitute who serves God only because God pays him well. But so much more develops in this. He says that he will worship God in spite of the absence. Indeed, he will worship God even in the midst of of his suffering. And he does. Now we have here the, the, you have this prose epilogue, which begins in chapter 42, verses 7 to 9. In, there, there, in 7 to 9, in verse 7, God is angry with Job's three friends because they did not speak of him what is right, unlike his servant Job. Now that's somewhat surprising. You know, right after all that we've just looked at. Now, obviously, God's not approving everything Job said about him as he just rebuked Job for wrongly accusing him of injustice during his dispute with his friends. Job is accusing God of wrong during that. And God has just rebuked him for doing so, and Job has repented of that. So he's obviously not referring to everything that Job said. Rather, he's saying Job spoke of him what is right in that Job, by steadfastly maintaining his own righteousness, by refusing to deny the truth that he was, in fact, a righteous person, that by doing that, he, in effect, he denied the the friend's false claim That God governs the world according to a strict or absolutist retributive justice. That he brings suffering on all the unrighteous and only on the unrighteous. And he pours out blessing on all the righteous and only on the righteous. You see, that is false. That is what his friends continued to say to Job. And by saying and by refusing to buckle and refusing to say, okay, you're right, I'm a sinner, that's why I'm being punished. Even though that would be a lie. By refusing that, Job was saying in effect, what you are saying, that God governs the world according to an absolutist retributive justice is false. So God commends Job for standing and for making that clear, that that is not how God governs the world. Now, of course, Job thought that God's not doing that, that that made God unjust. Because Job accepted the same view. He accepted the absolutist retributive justice view. He thought God should operate that way. But he nevertheless, you see, rejected implicitly that God does in fact operate that way. By saying, I'm righteous and getting the hammer and I won't say otherwise, he's saying your claim that God operates that way is false. And God commends him for that. Now, he also spoke of God, what is right, in his confession, where he agreed that he had obscured counsel by speaking in ignorance 
about things that were out of his league. Well, Job spoke right in that. And that carries an acknowledgement that God knows best and that God is to be trusted in his governance of creation even when we don't comprehend his working. Now, that's one of the hardest things in life. That's one of the hardest things in life is to trust God when we can't understand what he's doing. It's like, come on. I have to be able to understand. If I can't understand, I can't go with it. And that's the message. <laughs> you see, and Job has had a breakthrough in this theophany. So it's, it's less offensive to God. As I see this, it's less offensive to God for a righteous sufferer to accuse him falsely of injustice than for one who's not suffering to falsely accuse God of governing the world by an absolutist retributive justice and consequently to accuse the righteous sufferer of wickedness. He says, this is better. And some weeks ago, I went into more detail about why that would be. That you're, being, you're still somebody who's open to the truth and willing to let your theology be tested by reality. But he says, that's better. You guys who kept harping and shutting your minds to what was staring you in the face and saying, no, 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 just to protect your false theology. You were slandering me in that because I don't run the world that way. And you had it right there from the mouth of somebody who was highly credible. In fact, he's the most righteous guy on the planet telling you. And what did you do? I refused to entertain the possibility that I could be wrong. All right, that's death. That's death. And God says, no, you weren't doing all right. All right, in 42, in 10 and 11, Job had learned to submit himself to God's sovereign power and wisdom beyond his limited understanding without any promise that he would be restored. See, in that quote I gave you from along when he said, this is important, it is important. Because Job did this without any promise that he would be restored. But when Job prayed for his three friends, which is, you know, God instructed him. I didn't, I didn't comment on that, but God instructed. I'll go back here. Back and forth. He instructs the three friends to take bulls and rams uh, and to Job and to offer them as sacrifices on their behalf. Job is to intercede on their behalf in a priest-like role, right? Which certainly indicates that this is something before the time of the Mosaic priesthood. You remember I said, I think this is pre-patriarchal. This is very old. So he has Job and he's, Job go, is going to function in a priest-like role and God says that he will accept Job's prayer for them and not deal with them in accordance with the foolish things that they had said about him. And you've got to understand, right, in this, in this battle over these uh, wisdom teachers, one of them saying, you know, you're a blowhard, you don't know anything, you see this stuff. Now God intervenes and God says, you guys are in the wrong. And in fact, why don't you take a sacrifice and let Job offer it on your behalf? Ooh, <laughs> I can see these guys going, hmm, I guess we really were wrong. You, know, you don't get much more of an indication that God coming and saying that to you. See, and they did as instructed, and God accepts Job's prayer as promised. And then in 10 and 11, so Job, he'd learned to submit in light of this, this epiphany, this, this theophany. And is the, as he's exposed and re, comes to this deeper realization of God's power and wisdom beyond his understanding. But he did that without that promise that he would be restored. But when Job does this, when Job prays for the three friends, those who had accused and burdened him, well, what does God do? Well, God then in his sovereignty and wisdom, he chose to restore what Job had lost and to bless Job with twice the material prosperity he had before. This wasn't quid pro quo. 
This wasn't, I'll do this in exchange for this. He's simply humbled and broken and realizes then God in his sovereignty chooses to do what he does. And he wound up blessing Job, you see. And that blessing begins with his embrace, his family and acquaintances coming back and embracing him, who had turned from him in his distress, you remember. They had abandoned him. Why? Because they said he's a closet sinner, a horrible sinner. Guy's a joke, a hypocrite. Want nothing to do with him, despise him, spit in front of him. Okay, well now they're coming back to him. You see, and they're embracing him here. And you saw that they had turned from him. You see in chapter 6, chapter 19, that they had turned from him. Then in 12 to 17, Job is given wealth, a new family of seven sons and three daughters, and a long life of 140 additional years. So you, you get the sign, the message that God is very pleased with what Job has done. He's putting his approval on what Job has done here. And we said, Longman notes, he says, but now God in his wisdom and sovereignty chooses to restore Job to his previous good life and even more. Such a restoration is a narrative way of showing that Job had done the right thing. It would be wrong, however, to suggest that this is the way God will act with everyone. You see, if you turn into that, you fall right into the same thing of saying, do this and you'll have all this stuff. This is why I got all these people on television. Just telling you. You know, you invest some of this and you get this. And I can just see God saying, you think so? You, 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 think, you think you're over here manipulating me? You think you got me figured out that I can, you know, here you go over here and won't you buy me a Mercedes Benz? It just seems crazy, but you have people doing that and they get large crowds, much larger than this. All right, All right so, so he says, such a restoration is a narrative way of showing that Job had done the right thing. It would be wrong, however, to suggest that, that this is the way God will act with everyone. If we were to take this as a pattern by which God behaves, we'd be guilty of putting God in a box as the human characters of the book were throughout. We would be falling into exactly the same thing. All right, so this is, this is what's happening. Now, what I want to do, I can spend a few minutes drawing out some things that I think, you, you know, I'm not going to exhaust what you can glean from Job, and I hope that you've gleaned other things. But I want to give you some things that I think absolutely should not be missed in the theology of the book of Job. Okay, should not be missed. And the first thing is that God does not govern the world according to absolutist retributive justice. That is, he does not in this life bring suffering on all the unrighteous and only on the unrighteous and pour out blessings on all the righteous and only on the righteous. He makes exceptions according to his good purposes. He makes exceptions according to his good purposes. Now, God's good purpose is the second thing, and I think the central message of the book is that God's good purposes in making exceptions to retributive justice in allowing the righteous sometimes to suffer and the wicked sometimes to prosper cannot be discovered by human insight. Human wisdom is inadequate to the task. Human wisdom is inadequate to the task as illustrated by the prolonged debate where five different wisdom teachers grappled with Job's suffering, and essentially, what were they doing? They kept spinning their wheels, replowing the same ground, and never arriving at the truth. We, as the readers, saw the truth. Why? Because God revealed it to us. They, down here, who were in it, weren't privy to that revelation, and what was the result? That's why I'm convinced the book goes on the way it does. 
with a fair degree of repetition, different angles and that kind of thing. It is instilling or emphasizing the futility of human wisdom in arriving at the answers to certain things. And among those questions in which human wisdom is futile is the suffering of people. You see, that is, that is something that we do not, uh, can't reach. So unless, unless God reveals his reason for allowing undeserved or disproportionate suffering, we will never know it. Unless he reveals it, we will never know it. You see, that's something that, that is uh, important. See, those who can't accept this boundary to human wisdom, they sometimes conclude from their inability to perceive God's good purpose or to perceive any good purpose in suffering, since they say, I can't see it, I can't understand it, I can't figure it out. Well, they then conclude from that that no such purpose exists. Well, do you see that's simply another way of saying my wisdom is not bounded? If That's a way of saying if a good purpose existed, if there was a morally justifiable reason for the suffering, my wisdom would be able to perceive it. And because my wisdom cannot perceive it, therefore, no such reason exists. Do you see what I'm saying? It's this inability to accept this limitation of human wisdom that drives people to conclude, therefore, there is no morally justifiable reason for what seems to be innocent suffering. And therefore, either God doesn't exist, or, if he does exist, he's evil in that he's one who allows a morally unjustifiable suffering to go on when he could prevent it. Now, this is one of the atheist's largest attacks on theism. Always, for a long, long time, suffering, suffering. I don't believe in God. How can you allow it? Well, listen, I don't have to have the answer to be able to say, say to you, it is conceivable he has a reason that is beyond my ability to perceive. I am a finite, fallen, limited creature. And it is hubris to think that I can, I can comprehend everything that God could. That's just hubris. And yet that's where we live. Now, there are, of course, rare instances in which God reveals his reason for allowing what would otherwise appear to be gratuitous suffering. As readers, we're privy to the reason for Job's suffering, but those involved in it aren't. Jesus reveals in John 9, 3, that the person who was born blind, that he was born that way, that Jesus might display in him the works of God by healing him. And, of course, there's the Lord's horrific suffering on Golgotha, God lifts the veil in that instance to show us a case of his bringing ultimate blessing out of savage cruelty. He did something through the evil that he allowed to be perpetrated against his son that we would have never imagined if he hadn't told us. If he hadn't revealed that, we wouldn't sit down here and go, let me, let me calculate. Okay, crucified man, let me... You would have never figured it out. No human wisdom would have figured it out. Yet he revealed it to us. But generally, we remain in the dark and we have to trust the character of God beyond what we can figure out. You think of an infant whose parents must perform open-heart surgery on him to keep him alive. That baby doesn't know and is incapable of understanding the things that justify and make right and loving the pain and suffering to which his parents are subjecting him. The message of Job, give me a second, is that God knows things that we don't know and are incapable of knowing, and that if we knew those things, we'd understand how the suffering we see is justified and right and loving. 
Whenever suffering comes your way, this is easy to say, but it's the truth. Whenever suffering comes your way, cling to Almighty God. Let no suffering drive you to curse God, to walk away from Him. You'll be eternally grateful that you trusted Him beyond your ability to understand. Express your frustration, express your doubts, express your fears, even express your anger. But don't wind up concluding that he's wrong. Just say, I can't understand it. I can't figure it out. But I will trust the one who loves me so much that his son died for me. I can't see it. I can't understand it. But there's one thing I know. He loves me to death. Thanks for coming. Yeah.